Check one, two, check one, two. Hello, welcome to a presentation from the Lowell Area Historical Museum. We're glad you all could join us tonight um, to learn about this topic. Before we start, I'm gonna do a shameless couple of plugs for the museum, and then I will introduce our guest speaker. Um, as you've probably heard, uh, the Graham building that our museum is housed in is 150 years old this year. Um, and so to celebrate that, we are trying to renovate um, and renew our membership and get 150 new members this year. So trying to bring more people in to learn about the types of programs that we offer like this. Um, so if you're not a member or if you know someone that you think should be a member, we have these flyers on the table. Grab one as you're leaving. Membership is only $15. You get free admission to the museum, newsletters, all kinds of great things. Um, but mostly you're helping to support the museum. So if you're not a member, this is a great year to become one. And if you know somebody who you think would, would like to be a member, um, feel free to take one of those and share with them. The other thing we're doing this Saturday is an event with the Lowell Chamber of Commerce. They do these cookie adventures. Um, in connection with their spring fling. So this Saturday from two to five, people can buy one of these bags and go around town to different downtown businesses and collect a yummy cookie. So you get 10 cookies and the proceeds go to support the museum. So we have a bunch of bags in back. If you're interested and gonna be around on Saturday, come see us. Um, when these are sold out, they're sold out. They're um, a limited number. So we have those there. So thank you for listening to my plugs. Um, but now I'd like to turn the mic over. Um, Adam Oster is uh, the community outreach librarian with the Library of Michigan. And he does a number of these talks around the state. He's really an expert in this area. Um, he's got a lot of interest in local history and genealogy. And he agreed to come today to share with us in information on the county poor system in our state and in the ones more locally um, to us as well. So we're, we're thrilled to have him here. We've never had this type of a topic before, so we're really excited to be able to learn from Adam tonight and hear his presentation. So Adam, thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Wow, one person. <laughs> I, I know, a state employee shows up and they're all mad at him. <laughs> Well, I didn't do it. <laughs> well, it, it's great to be here in Lowell. Um, um, like she said, my name is Adam Oster. I'm the Community Engagement Outreach Librarian for the Library of Michigan. I've been there for just over four years. There is a possibility that maybe you might have seen me um, work in the reference desk over at the uh, Englehart Library just down the road because I did spend about just over nine years working for Kent District Library. Um, I was primarily at the... Byron Township and Kentwood branches, but there were some times that I got to do some sub shifts out in the wonderful community of Lowell. Um, certainly not my first time out here. I think one of my favorite times was my dad and I came for a Lowell versus East Grand Rapids High School football game when Keith Nickel was going against Kevin Grady. And guess who won? It was the Lowell Red Arrows. <laughs> And, that, and, and I'm originally from Zealand, and at the time, Zealand wasn't really doing too hot for football, but, you know, now that Zealand West is running the wing tee, it's someday. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But um, besides that, you know, just other times that I've been here in Lowell and just even a little bit of um, my dad used to go fishing out here with his dad and his brother at Murray Lake, which I think is not too far from here. So, oh, you do? Nice. <laughs> so even though I'm not from Lowell, it's great getting to see the wonderful things that are in a community like this and just get to talk about this topic. Um, just a little bit of background of where I first got started in researching uh, First Maple Grove and then Michigan Poor Farms is uh, back in 2012, I was taking a class at Grand Valley State University just on techniques in local and archival history, just on a whim, wanted to do it for professional development. And we had to pick a topic that related to either Grand Rapids or uh, Kent County history. At the time, I was working at the Kentwood branch of KDL, and that's on Breton and in between 44th and 52nd Street. Well, I found out as I was starting to do research on, on a little bit related to the area, just down the road on 32nd Street between Breton and Kalamazoo was where the Kent County Poorhouse used to be. 
So I started researching for the class, turned in my paper, um, but felt like I hadn't done enough and started doing more. And like I said, that was in 2012. It's now been almost 13 years. My mom and dad might say this is an obsession. I like to call it a hobby. We'll see what happens out of it. Um, but as we're going along here, I want to sort of showcase um, the history of Maple Grove, how it um, impacted the, uh, the Kent County community, and then also use that to illustrate how other poor houses in Michigan um, were one of those, uh, in a sense, community anchors that provided services to people that might not have the same level of um, whether it's funds or health or other different things to make it in, in, in normal society. And as you're going around in your own family history, if you are somebody who does a lot of genealogy research, you may find that you have a poor farm inmate who is in your family tree. Um, you can see on the, um, on the picture here is my great, great grandmother, Hattie Oster, who for many years was living in Gratia County um, in the Wheeler Breckenridge area. And a few years after her husband, uh, William Henry Oster, passed away uh, at the age of 77 years old, she was registered as being an inmate at the Gratiot County Poorhouse. The building is still there today. She was only there for a few months, um, but was later transferred up to the Traverse City Asylum, where she was there from, uh, I think, uh, from 1924 until her death until 1927. So you will often find that sometimes these places were the transition point from going to um, on their way to a state asylum. Um, and you may find more, um, more about that connection kind of as we're going along. So, um, but when it comes to sort of the origins of Michigan poor law, um, you'll find that it's really uh, based on the legislation from many New England states um, and also that connection to Elizabethan poor law. Um, if you're familiar with like all of the stories from Charles Dickens that deal with the workhouses, there's very much a connection to that in the poor, the poor law that we have in the United States. So just kind of a, a, a rundown of a few of those early pieces of legislation. Uh, 1805, an act for the relief of the poor, um, allowed a pauper to petition three justices of the peace, alleging that such person is destitute of support and is incapable of labor. The justices were to investigate the claim, and if they found it to be true, they would grant the pauper a certificate and approve the pauper to becoming a public charge. Um, the law also outlined a procedure for the marshal of the territory to contract with a person offering the lowest terms for the support of such pauper, provided that no contract be made for a greater sum than 25 cents for a day. So what they were doing once that was passed, and keep in mind, this is around the this is the first year that Michigan was a territory. Beyond be, uh, past that, we were part of the um, it was the Northwest Ordinance or Northwest Territories, or you know where we were combined with like Ohio and several other um, Great Lakes states. So this is where we're first kind of developing our own. When the capital was based in Detroit, and there was very few people in, in, in Michigan at that time. A few years later was the Act for the Support of the Poor, which defined who was eligible for public support and set up the three-member panel known as the Overseers of the Poor, and that was based on a Vermont law. Um, 1917, an Act for the Relief of the Poor allowed the children of the poor to be bound out to apprenticeship, um, and they also repealed that 1805 Act. Um, so further legislation would go on, but then sort of the big one that kind of sets the scene for several decades is the act to authorize the establishment of poor houses. And this is when we have just uh, two years later, the first county poor house in Michigan, um, which was uh, in Wayne County. Um, it would be, I think near Hamtramck, and I forget what the cross street was, but eventually it would make its way down to uh, over what is now like the Canton and Wayne area of um, Wayne County. And for anybody who is familiar with Eloise that was over there, that's what the Wayne County Poorhouse evolved into, which was a 70 plus building complex. Um, essentially the largest poorhouse in all of Michigan would be down there and they would also have their own mental hospital. And uh, I think there was also a tuberculosis hospital there at that time, but that would be several decades of evolution until it got to that. Um, and then another piece of legislation that's important to know 
is Public Act uh, 148 of 1869, which is the act to revise and consolidate the several acts relating to the support and maintenance of poor persons. Government loves long names. Um, but what that did, it did is that it sort of consolidated, did some revisions um, when it came to how we supported and maintained people um, in Michigan and also led to the creation of the State Board of Corrections and Charities, which um, I'll show a graphic in just a minute of what, what that really did. So let's give some definitions. What is a poorhouse? Um, a place maintained at public expense to house the needy or dependent persons within a county. Um, when we go to a port farm, it's essentially a rural poorhouse or a city farm basing its economy off of farming. They were meant to be self-sustaining, but few ever turned any sort of a profit. Um, I've seen a couple ones in Michigan that did do so at different time periods. Calhoun County down in Marshall, their facility there um, actually was doing pretty well when it came to, you know, making money off of what they were, the, the farming that they were doing there, um, using the support of the inmates and people that were there. They had prize winning um, steers that would be at like county fairs. So you can see that, you know, some of these places they were able to actually make some money um, in order to maintain the place beyond what limited tax dollars that were being able to use to help it. Um, all able-bodied residents were required to work. Um, if you could help out in the fields, you'd be out there, but it could be everything from washing dishes to doing laundry. If you could help out in any sort of way, um, you were required to do so. Um, and like I said, the first poorhouse in Michigan, uh, Wayne County, which was established in 1832, just outside of Detroit. A few other roles and definitions of support. Um, Superintendents of the poor are three elected officials that oversaw the county's poor department, and it was their role to investigate the claims of individuals that applied for relief. In most cases, um, and certainly here in Kent County, they were elected officials. Um, and by that, and you'd have people that were looking to get into higher office, but they just used the superintendents of the poor role to be like their stepping stone into moving up. Some guys would be there for their three-year term and then move up to something else beyond that, Board of Commission, something else like that. Uh, Genesee County, they actually, what they did is that their Board of Supervisors, they would then designate three people and say, you are the, also the superintendents of the poor. Uh, poor farm keeper overseer supervised the operations of the county's poor farm. Um, there would sometimes be a poor farm matron, typically the keeper's wife, who would assist with the poor farm's female inmates. Almost always, everybody was separate. You would have the building, women on one side, men on the other. Um, when it comes to some other sorts of terms that you may find when you're doing any sort of research into these types of facilities or looking at the legislation, outdoor relief is the assistance in the form of money, food, clothing, or goods given to alleviate poverty without the requirement that somebody go into an institution. Um, you know, we find that in some form today still, whether whether it's, uh, you know, bridge card or, you know, different sorts of charities. But this was where they were trying to keep people either in their own homes or this would come in other ways where, like, it would be a train ticket to send somebody to go live with a family member that was in Kalamazoo or sending them back to where they came from in another county. Um, indoor relief, uh, that's where they would be institutionally housed, and that would be anybody who is poor, chronically ill, or mentally handicapped. Um, another interesting thing is how non-residents come into this. And any person who had lived less than one year in a county would either be transported to their last county of origin, or the county of origin would be charged for relief services. This includes in death. There are uh, times uh, that I've seen where somebody died at the Kent County Poorhouse and they were originally from Isabella County and you can find where their body got transported up to the cemetery that was behind where the Isabella County Poorhouse is up in Shepherd. I've also seen instances, um, one for example is a, um, a Civil War soldier named Samuel Rogers who was uh, after the war was a longtime newspaper editor in the Grand Rapids area uh, he somehow died at the Berrien County Poorhouse from cancer, and eventually his body was transported up and is buried in the Kent County Poorhouse Cemetery. The only thing that I can't figure out is 
why he was buried there, because you would think somebody who was a prominent uh, newspaper editor was a Civil War veteran. Something would have resulted in him being buried someplace else, but that's another mystery for me to keep searching into. Um, but there are in instances in other places where you would find veterans who would end up at these facilities and being buried out in the cemetery. Um, this is kind of a breakdown that just shows how the State Board of Corrections and Charities fits in with um, the state of Michigan and all these other institutions. You can see on one side, we have the asylums, the state hospitals, uh, first one being Kalamazoo that was uh, developed in 1859, uh, Pontiac, Traverse City, Ionia, uh, Ionia being the um, state asylum for the criminally insane, uh, Lapeer, Cairo, Newberry up in the UP, and then the psychopathic hospital at the University of Michigan. Uh, we also have the Institution for the Deaf, Dumb, and the Blind that was in Flint. Um, they did also have a school for the blind that was in Lansing for several decades as well. Um, we have our Kent County Poor House, or our County Poor Houses, the State Public School in Coldwater that was also the, the orphanage, um, the Reform Schools, the Boys School in Lansing, and the Girls School in Adrian, and then our state prisons, the primary ones um, during this time, Jackson, Ionia, and Marquette. So let's start looking into, now that we have this greater context of the legislation and how things are, are sort of set up, let's start looking at how things were going in Kent County itself. Um, before we had a poor farm, um, in the first four to five years after settling Grand Rapids, there was no provisions made for supporting the poor. Um, it was in uh, January of 1839 when the first meeting of the Kent County Superintendents of the Poor was at the home of C.I. Walker. Uh, George Sheldon was chosen as chairman and Walker as clerk. Uh, and the first provision made to support two indigents was made for supporting two indigent families in Granville and one woman in Grand Rapids. I don't know their names, but it'd be really interesting to know more about their story. Um, they also raised $300 to support the poor. Um, they were working under the farming out to the lowest bidder uh, type of process at that time. Um, and focusing more on outdoor relief as opposed to indoor relief. And something that's kind of important to also know is that a lot of the local benevolent societies that would start to pop up weren't really around at that time, whether it was the Union Benevolent Association, YMCA, Holland Home, St. John's Orphan Asylum, the Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, I know Blodgett House would also be another one that wouldn't show up for a long time as well. So there, there was not anything during that initial settling of Grand Rapids other than this for supporting um, the poor and indigent. Looking at how this is at the local level, we have the Board of Supervisors, our three superintendents of the poor, county uh, poor house or keeper. Um, you can see there's a dotted line that's going to a visiting physician. They would contract with somebody who would occasionally come over to check people out. Um, it was usually the lowest bidder. So don't expect to get high level care if you're gonna be at a place like this. And then also we have the poor house matron and um, if they developed enough of a size where they need to have contracted laborers or people who they were um, giving some sort of salary to, they would often have them. If you're trying to follow the money, we have where the cities and townships would have tax dollars that would go into the county poor fund, but then they themselves would also find the they would have their own local poor fund or outdoor relief funds that they would use. Um, and that picture on the bottom shows just where it says poor fund in one of the treasury records for Cascade Township um, from, I think it's the 18, sometime in the 1870s. Just to put some faces to some of these job titles, if we're looking at um, Grand Rapids in 1925. Charles Godfrey was the poor house keeper from 1925 to 1936. Um, and then his wife, Maria, was the matron. And then uh, we also have three of our superintendents of the poor, Ashley Ward, Isaac Apple, and uh, William Thomas, who all served during the 1920s and 1930s. Don't dress in suits like that these days. They look pretty good. <laughs> Uh, and this is just a picture that was from the Evening Press uh, in 1907, and um, the title of the article at that time was How the County Cares for Its Unfortunates, and then this one is tagged The Folks Who Care for the Unfortunates. And something that's important to kind of note, too, is that the terminology that you'll hear or read as you're 
looking at newspaper record, you know, newspaper articles or records or different things like that. You know, we don't use, you know, terms like idiot or indigent or inmate towards the poor, but that was de- whether, uh, you know, idiot was used as a classification and inmate was used to describe somebody who we th- these days would maybe refer to as a resident or a patient. So it's, it's interesting also just looking how our terminology and lexicon changes over time and how much it had, you know, that stigma that many of us have maybe heard about when, uh, if we were old enough to go pass by some of these facilities and you would have a family member say, you don't want to ever go there because of that stigma that was atta- you know, attached to it. Looking at the first poor farm in Kent County itself, it was located in Walker Township in Section 22. Um, it would be at the modern day corner of Lake Michigan Drive and Oakley Avenue. Um, if you're, anybody remembers Shawmut Hills, um, that would have been over there at that time. I think it's now uh, a gym. It's been turned into. Um, there was a resolution passed by the county commissioners to purchase a poor farm in 1839. Uh, the following year, they purchased a, a property from a Jacob Schneider uh, in July of 1840 for $330. Uh, very few people were sent there. It averaged two people at any given time. Um, and the public started complaining about the cost. You can find articles where they're like, why are we paying for this? There's hardly anybody there. And so in seven years later, in May of 1847, they sold the property to a Daniel Sherman Horn. And this is an 1855 article, and you can see roughly where that property was um, on the map. I haven't found like an actual map from the time period of when the farm was there, but there are property records um, that uh, from the county that do identify that's the general area where it was. So once we left using our first poor farm, we returned back to farming people out. Uh, and continued private outdoor relief. And if we had anybody who was mentally handicapped or insane, uh, they would be sent outside of the state to institutions in northeastern United, the northeastern United States. So one example of that is the Vermont Asylum for the Insane. Um, if anybody's familiar with Sluman Bailey, Sluman Bailey was living in the Octagon House that was at, I think it was um, 32nd and Schaefer in the Catwood area. If you ever drive by there, I think it was last being used as like a, um, uh, like a CPA or a county office. Um, but at one point, he was working as a superintendent of the poor. And in 1857, if you read through his diary, it talks about how he made arrangements to go to the Vermont Asylum to get two insane persons that belong to this county and bring them back. Their names are McGrath and Fields. Uh, took the stage at the Rapids and arrived at Kalamazoo about 5 o'clock and took the cars, meaning the train. Uh, about 10 p.m. arrived in Lockport, New York. Uh, or About 10 p.m. Uh, arrived at Lockport, New York about 4 p.m. Um, and then April 16, he writes, returned on April 15 with the two men and left them at the county poorhouse. So he had to drive or essentially go all the way out to Vermont, grab these two people who were in, labeled as insane, and then bring them back here to Michigan. Um, I'm not sure how that ride would have been. <laughs> it would have been an interesting uh, interesting. Uh, drive even if you were taking a car or flying a plane like today in modern times. Uh, Looking at when they finally reestablished the poor house, this is in 1855, so we get a few years later, and it was located in Section 16 of Paris Township, um, what we would now refer to as, uh, it's it's now City of Grand Rapids, but um, just next to it is what would be the City of Kentwood. Uh, they purchased property for $1,800 from an Ira W. w. Evans, which came with a 20-foot by 24-foot log cabin and 30-foot by 24-foot frame attachment. In um, the 1856 Superintendents of the Poor Report to the Board of Supervisors, there was 11 paupers at the poor farm and two were considered insane. So 11 people in that small building. Um, They then replaced the log cabin in 1860 with a frame building, and then by the 1870s, a separate fool's house building was constructed 200 feet from the main building. So 
that could be either for people that were considered insane or it could be for keeping people that had, whether it was tuberculosis or some other sort of disease from getting into the rest of the general population of the people there. And this is a picture that shows where the Ira W. Evans property is. This, If you're looking on um, a modern day map, which I think I have got right here. So this is a picture of what that frame house looks like and where the red dot is, is roughly where it would be. You can see on the um, east side, there's Breton by Hamilton Early Childhood Center. And then over there on the west side is Kalamazoo. And also, um, what's kind of interesting is that down at that corner of 32nd and Kalamazoo would be where the Paris Township Hall was. So they weren't too far away um, from where the township offices were. Um, so most ta uh, townships, ta uh, Section 16 is usually rever or reserved for municipal services because it's the middle of, of, of the entire township. And this is just a shot that shows the land that they had. Um, and they would eventually have property on both sides of 32nd Street um, uh, 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 with several hundred acres of property. Let's talk a little bit about life at the poor farm. Uh, description in the narrative included in an 1872 annual report to the state says, uh, facilities for bathing, none other than wash tubs and they are well used. Warming of buildings by common stoves. Food consists of wheat and cornbread, salt and fresh pork, salt and fresh beef, salt fish, a lot of salt, uh, potatoes, onions, beans, and all other vegetables in their season. So, you know, their diet was very much a farm kind of uh, food that you would be eating. Um, in 1879, there was an article in the Grand Rapids Daily Leader that says the present charges number 39 includes every class of unfortunate humanity, worn out old men and women, paralytics, epileptics, lunatics, and idiots. The, the policy is to obtain later labor from everyone capable of work and to such as do work to give them good food and plenty of it. Uh, and these are all direct quotes. Uh, Sarah Cowell is a foolish woman employed about the kitchen, a sister Phoebe cared for in the full house as a total idiot, reduced to simply animal instincts. Four from this family have been inmates here at one time. I mean, it's, it's strange and a little sad. I mean, but, you know, this is a time where, you know, we, we still don't have a lot of the types of things that we would utilize today for caring for these people. I mean, it's very much a roof over your head, three square meals a day, and that's kind of what you're getting. Um, now, for anybody who'd be sent away um, around this time, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier when I was talking about the um, structure of the Board of Corrections and Charities, um, for somebody who was mentally handicapped to the point that they would need to go to one of the state asylums, um, the Michigan Asylum for the Insane in Kalamazoo is probably your likely place that you're going to see somebody go to. Um, when the... Uh, Michigan Home for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic opened in Lapeer in 1895. You would see some people go there, but the differences between the two kind of depended on, on, on the kind of mental handicap that somebody had. Uh, they would be more likely to go to Lapeer if they had um, something where you could be trained to somehow go back into regular society. If you went to someplace like Kalamazoo, you are more likely going to be staying there until you passed away. Um, and then we also have the State Public School for Orphan Children, which opened in Coldwater in 1874. Um, the legislation was is that you would not keep kids at poor houses. They were either fostered out in the local community. Maybe you would have a children's asylum, um, like here where it would have been like St. John's or Blodgett House. Um, but many would end up going to Coldwater, and that's where they would be until they uh, would either get adopted or essentially graduate and reach the age of 18. So a couple different places that people would go to. I try to highlight a couple different inmates just to kind of show some individual people that I have some biographies about. Uh, one of them is Esther Lott. She was uh, born around 1823 in New York. Um, and while she was there, she worked as a milliner, a person who makes or sells hats um, and would continue to make hats while living at the poor farm. This is the one picture that I have for her that's uh, an illustration from an 1899 
uh, Grand Rapids Herald article. Uh, reason for at the poor farm, she first went there because of a taint of the blood causing sores on her limbs and had no compunctions to showing the reporter unasked a number of terrible scars situated midway between the knee and the hip. My thinking is that she probably had mercury poisoning because if you think of the Mad Hatter from uh, the Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, the whole idea with the Mad Hatter, and I think they even featured this recently at that, the, the, the poison exhibit at the Grand Rapids Public Museum, mercury was being used when they're making hats. It's going to get into you somehow and cause you to do some interesting things. Uh, she referred to herself as Queen Esther and took care of many of the other inmates at the poor farm. She had a very maternal kind of instinct about her. Uh, it's unknown when she first came to Michigan, but she lived at the poor farm roughly about 35 years. Uh, she died in 1905, and she's buried out at the cemetery in an unmarked grave. Um, I know roughly, I think it's, yeah, I think it's unmarked, uh, but I know roughly the general area of where she is out there. So... Some of these places, um, not everyone, but some of them would have some different scandals that would show up when you're dealing with this kind of a crowd um, and some of the people that would be working there. It's bound to have some issues. Um, but starting uh, in October 13, 1874, uh, the Daily Morning Times and, and newspapers started running a series of articles describing allegations of abuse by the poor farm keeper. Um, when you look at some of the headlines, it says great allegations against the management. Either the superintendent is a brute or an injured man. It looks bad for Mr. Otis. Uh, more charges against Otis the keeper. It looks as if Otis should be ousted. Um, other ones, a curse and a hell is under its present management. The most damning evidence yet brought forward. So as this was going on, the County Board of Supervisors started the special committee to start investigating they were taking testimony up until October 27, and different things that were being said was that John Otis was beating people. He was feeding them poor meat from like a butchered sick cow. Um, wasn't looking that great for him. Um, and so by November 5, the special committee presented its findings, and what later happened was that uh, the superintendent, one of the superintendents of the poor, William Lepig, uh, would resign, and then Otis would be gone uh, by December of 1874. I haven't been able to find any sort of a, like, complete write-up or report on it. You have to kind of rely on what you can find in the newspapers. Um, but something that was kind of interesting that I found um, was that during the investigation, I found a couple of newspapers where it said, uh, articles where this uh, one of them was saying, the county house investigation has been dramatized. We put on the stage of the Academy of Music tomorrow evening. The play is a complete takeoff on the whole business uh, and being admirably written, it cannot fail to produce sensation. Um, pretty much what somebody did is they're like, I'm going to write a play on this. And uh, in a way, it's like early satire. If you think about some of the, you know, the late night stuff that we see on like the daily show or, or something like that, it's kind of that version of it going on in, you know, just Grand Rapids, just down the road. So, um, but finally, you know, they were able to get over this situation and start moving on. Um, we're, we're starting to get now into um, the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and then you start seeing where there's a need for a new building, um, partially because of just the number of people that were coming here. You know, we're now getting past that point of the major influx of immigration coming to the Grand Rat, well, just coming to Michigan in general um, and other parts of the United States. Um, and this was an interesting word I had to look up where this one 1892 article says the rookeries at the Kent County Poor Farm. Rookeries is another word for slum. Um, so they, it was kind of getting bad there. Uh, other articles were calling it a county disgrace, um, a power magazine that was going to uh, uh, go on fire at any minute. Um, there's some inspection records from the Ar state archives where they have some lines, in, like this one in 1887. This is the most wretched poor house, or this most miserable poor house, old and wretchedly planned, full of vermin, should have a new one. And then a few uh, year later, old and dilapidated, Kent County should be ashamed of such a poor house. So things aren't looking too great. Um, but luckily, the county 
um, would eventually uh, find the money um, and start planning for a new building. Planning started in 1891. Uh, construction then began in uh, April of 1892 with a com building co uh, completed that December with a formal dedication in 1893. Um, cost $25,000 for the building, 10,000 for furnishings. A uh, few things about it, it was two stories in the basement and there were two cells in the basement. So you had some hard folks, they would sometimes go down there. Um, seven bathrooms had steam heating. Um, and I think anybody who would remember the Kent County Poor House or when it was later called Maple Grove, this is that main building I think a lot of people would think of um, if they were there. And these are just some pictures from the exterior from a 1909 article. So you can see um, where there was the vegetables out in the garden. On the bottom on the left, you can see the dining room area where it's very long uh, tables. It's not individual tables like what you would find at a restaurant. Um, and then on the right, you can see one of, uh, it's, uh, one of the women's dormitories. You're not getting any privacy. It's just a bed and that's it. Um, and to end with this slide, um, the three women that are on the bottom there, it says uh, three of the oldest inmates, Esther Ingalls, Amanda Jones, and Annie Myers, they have been county charges since girlhood. So I don't know how much of that is, is true, but I know for sure the middle one, Amanda Jones, is also buried at the cemetery as well. So why, why have one scandal when you can have two? Um, 1905, this was actually not an issue initially with the poor housekeeper. It was actually his wife who was accused for being cruel to some of the inmates there. And you start seeing things like uh, more articles uh, where they were trying to get her to leave and trying to get everybody to leave. Um, and it started going into this sort of back and forth of trying to get the poor housekeeper and his, uh, his wife and family to no longer be there. But one thing that, that if you're looking at the superintendents of the poor, they don't have like executive authority in the way where they can just call the police and tell people to leave. Um, at least they didn't at this time. Um, but what it sort of turned into was just this war of attrition. And then finally um, they were able, uh, it just ended up that, uh, the Brownell family just said, okay, we're out of here. We're gone. And this finally ended in January of 1906. And I have found in the, some of the board packets from that time period where there is a letter that um, the poor housekeeper wrote to the board of supervisors. And you would find some of this stuff that was written in the newspaper. So you can kind of get a, an idea of what is going on, but it's still something that you wish you were there. You wish you could have been the fly on the wall and just seeing like, you know, what was going on in the board of supervisor meetings versus what was going on out at the poor house. Um, but luckily that finally ended and, um, and that they were able to move on again. Um, but now we're also getting to a point where they're in the need of uh, a new building. Um, something also to know too, is that by 1909, poor houses and poor farms in Michigan were, renamed county infirmaries due to requirements of the Michigan State Constitution of 1908. So that meant the Kent County Poor Farm would become starting known as the Kent County Infirmary or the Kent County Home. And because of the increasing numbers and the need for medical facilities, um, they started planning for a new hospital building. And then in 1917, a $45,000 hospital building was constructed, um, which is the picture that you see in front right here. And just to give you a perspective, it would have been on the, um, uh, that's the west side, west side of the building. I had to, had to think of my direction of where it would be at. But these are some uh, pictures of some of the other inmates um, that were there in 1925 um, when that building uh, had only been constructed just a few years earlier. And as this is kind of showing is that it's not just a body warehouse. You're starting to see where you know, more modern day medical uh, services are being incorporated into it um, and that it's starting to become a bit more than just, 
you know, a place to, to have three square meals a day and a roof over your head, that you're starting to see a, gr- a little bit of a greater sense of community that's going on. And this is kind of that early age of where we're starting to see things that would show, eventually show up in modern day retirement homes and nursing homes that we see today. Um, now we're starting to get into the time period of like the Great Depression. That certainly hit um, Kent County quite well, uh, especially when it came to the inmate numbers. So you can see starting in 1925, we're over the course of the year, you have 328 people. Next year, 332, 356, 380, 387. And then by 19, after 1929 into 1930, it's 469, 474, 515, 564. And then it's finally starting to go down. And that's as things like those new deal programs are starting to be passed at the federal level um, and other different legislation that is coming into use. We also see as a result of this, a need for an initial dormitory. Um, And people were, before this was built, people were sleeping on cots in the main building's basement chapel and smoking room. They did have a smoking room. Um, And so 1930 plans for a $42,000 two-story annex dormitory building were approved. And by uh, December, it was completed. They must have rushed out there to get it done before the snow was really coming down. Another inmate I like to highlight is this gentleman by the name of Alfred Bates. And when I'm talking about a Mr. Bates, it's not that kind of Mr. Bates from Downton Abbey. Totally different. That Mr. Bates did not spend time at Sing Sing Prison um, for, uh, I believe he shot a man. Uh, Yeah, uh, so he had three years of there also had been charged for felonious assault in uh, Pennsylvania. And somehow this guy made his way to Grand Rapids and somehow got into the Kent County Poorhouse. At this time, now it's the, the county infirmary. So this is a picture of Mr. Bates. A lot different than from our Downton Abbey type of guy. But one of the things that happened was that he decided to get into a fight with somebody at um, the dormitory building. So and we're going to kind of follow the path that he's going uh, during that evening. And so the poor housekeeper says, look, I'm calling the police. You're going to be out of here. So Mr. Bates decides to head out to the field where he had some whiskey hidden away. Got himself drunk comes back and he decides to light a barn on fire. So, but yet, as he was then leaving, he had the wherewithal to say to somebody who was working there at the time, oh yeah, the barn's on fire, you might want to get the animals out of it, as he's heading out. And then finally, they caught him, trying to remember exactly where it was. He was starting to head towards downtown Grand Rapids. Um, But they did catch him and he was like, I did it. I want to go to jail. I'm just done with this. And guess what? He went to jail. They ended up sending him to uh, Jackson Prison for a sentence of three to ten years. I haven't figured out yet if he died there or not, but it wouldn't surprise me because he was 73 years old at the time that he went in. So he got what he wanted. Now we can start to see some transitions. Um, These are just some photos that kind of represent the changes of the time period. If we look at how things are in 1909, 1950, 1953, 1968, you can see the beds are changing. We're starting to see things like televisions and privacy, curtains, things that that show that it's approaching much more of that medical, more nursing home type of facility. Um, A few other different pieces of legislation to know about. Um, Act 280, a public act's Uh, from 1939 is the Michigan Welfare Reorganization uh, Act, um, which establishes a county department of social welfare and abolishes the superintendents of the poor. And then the big one that I think was ultimately kind of the nail in the coffin for many of these facilities was Medicare, um, which is the National Health Insurance Program that started in 1965. Um, Primary health insurance for Americans uh, 65 and older, and also for people with uh, disability status. So um, we're also seeing that same sort of transition. These are some pictures just from uh, 1950 and seeing where it's going from Kent County Infirmary to Maple Grove Home to later being called Maple Grove Medical Facility. 
Um, you can see a picture where we got like the chapel. Um, these are some of the cows and pigs that they had outside um, for during the, the farming. But then finally, it was in 1957 when they stopped all farming operation out there and sold off all the implements um, for that. So, and that's pretty indicative for a lot of other poor houses and in, in, uh, county infirmaries like this across Michigan. Um, I think Ottawa counties, they were still doing farming up until like the 1990s because they were using it as a therapy and not necessarily for being a use of like supporting the facility. And so this is just showing we now have the uh, Department of Social Welfare, Board of Social Welfare, all these different um, divisions underneath it and including Maple Grove Medical Facility um, as a part of that in 1965. And now we're starting to see, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, more of those types of therapy um, uh, activities that are being added in. They were having fairs. They were um, having a wood shop that was installed. You would see uh, activities where people would be leaving to go on like group fishing trips or uh, different art activities. Um, so it's now reaching a greater sense of community as well with here. And it's not just like, you're there to just wait until the end. Um, this was a re in really interesting set of photos that I got uh, to scan from a, um, a gentleman by the name of Rich Van Houten. His parents both worked there. And this is a 98th birthday party that was going on for a gentleman by the name of Loring Goldsmith. Um, and so this is him with uh, several of his friends who he was uh, with at the time. This would be on top of the infirmary hospital building um, uh, on the second floor there. There's Loring right there. He's looking pretty good for 98. But my favorite photo is this one, and it's the back where it has the names of everybody and all of their ages and the total years that's all combined together. This is like a genealogist, like, oh my goodness, this is what I was looking for. And it's a total years of 846. Just think of the stories that these guys would have had. If I could have been at this birthday party with a tape recorder and just said, tell me everything, just let it out. <laughs> but as we're seeing, once we're getting into the 50s and 60s, uh, things are starting to get bad um, in the sense of just like the building's old. It's now approaching, you know, 70 some years in age. You know, there's pipes all over the place. It's not a... a a modern condition, those same sorts of things that were being talked about in the 1880s and 1890s are coming up again. Um, there was even a group that would, um, uh, you know, was officially saying that like, look, you gotta do something or you're gonna get condemned. Um, so what first happened was then in 1966, they proposed a one mill property tax increase um, on the ballot to replace it, a four-year plan for $5 million, but unfortunately that millage was rejected. Um, as a result, they were also then put on a one-year probation to make the facility safe. Um, but then the following year, April of 1967, they put a new millage on. A lot of the problem was that they just didn't get the word out. They were, they, they were, they knew that they like hadn't done a really good job of trying to get across to the public the need for this uh, this new building. Um, and so the millage passes for a two to one margin. Um, and what that results in was a renovation and a reuse of uh, Sunshine Hospital, which is the old tuberculosis hospital up on Fuller. So if you go out there, they're still being used. Um, at one point it was, um, they changed the name to Kent Community Hospital. It then was Spectrum Health Continuing Care. Um, I haven't really walked around the building other than just on the outside of it, but you could see, you know, one proposal that they had and then what the addition was that they ended up putting on, on the front of Sunshine Hospital. Um, but you can drive around and still see what the original portions of when it was the, tuber the tuberculosis building. Now it comes to the question of what to do with the old building, uh, possibly rezone it for residential use possibly give it to MSU for the Agricultural Extension Service. Um, my vote would have been Kent County Library's headquarters because I only would have had to go in a mile for meetings instead of having to go all the way up to uh, um, Comstock Park when I was still working for KDL. Uh, but what they eventually did is they sold it to a company called Prairie Inc. 
So all the buildings and 33 acres were purchased for $150,000. Uh, the initial plans were to convert it into a private retirement apartment complex called Calvin Christian Home. Here's the thing about it. Calvin Christian Home is not about John Calvin. The Calvin name comes to the guy who owned Prairie Inc., whose name was Calvin Dalton. Uh, if you talk to people who invested in this facility, I had one person who just last, the last time I gave this presentation, um, a woman yells out from the side, do you know who Calvin Dalton is? And I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and she was very, very unhappy because she had heard about him. I had one other person who referred to him as a shyster. Like, yeah, he, not a good dude. Just one of those people who the county shouldn't have sold it to him. Uh, but they did in 1971. Um, and then they had to move everybody. So 180 patients were transported to the new Kent Community Hospital. They used 100 Army Reservists to help move everybody. Uh, it's like Matt showed up, and there's Hawkeye Pierce helping you move the miles into Grand Rapids City. Uh, and then the walls came crumbling down. But here's the thing. If you look at the uh, article, it says, Buildings Gone, Raising Approved. That's because they started tearing things down before they got final approval to do so. Um, but what's interesting is that if you look at some of the pictures that were from that time period, you can see this one that's on the, the right, it says November 73 on top of it. This was in the parcel card record that's over at the Grand Rapids City Archives and Records Center. And it looks quite a bit like the old poorhouse building that they constructed in the 1860s. It would have been cool to go through that just to see how much was still being used and what what it was for. But something that was left behind as they were starting to tear things out, they discovered there were skeletons around in the ground and not in the cemetery. So this was in 1972, and I think it was ended up being about 15 or 20 skeletons that they discovered, um, and they ended up reburying them. But something to note is that the cemetery records were not well, you know, well kept. And so these were probably burials because they started burying people there in 1857 and the records were just not that well kept. This is a picture of what the cemetery looks like roughly today. This is uh, known as Ma uh, Maple Grove Cemetery. Um, and as it says on the plaque, burial records are sketchy and were never accurately maintained. The earliest burial that I know of, if you're out there in that section, is from 1893, 1894-ish. Um, this is uh, just to show you the one picture that I have from the cemetery that would have been in the 1890s, early 1900s. And then this is an aerial image that shows where the facility was. And you can see Plaster Creek. So the cemetery was roughly about 600 uh, I estimate about 600 feet away from the infirmary building. You can, you can still, like I said, go out there today to see it. Um, and these are the kind of grave markers that you're going to see. It's these stone ones um, that are from 1894 to 1907 that have the first and last name and birth and death year on it. There's some numbered stones. And then lastly, these metal plates um, that go from roughly around the 1920s to 1958, 1958 being the last year that they buried anybody. Um, but most of those are gone. There's only about five or six of them left. There's this odd stone out for a guy by the name of Carl Fry. And I don't really know that much about him other than the fact that he was divorced and died in 1951. He was born in 1908. But somebody made a stone for him and they punched it out on on, a, on an actual piece of uh, of real stone, and if you go out there today, there's two trees, one planted on each side of it that are that are very small that are for him. Um, so he must have had family that came to do that for him. Sammy Rogers, who I mentioned before, this is um, his gravestone. He's the Civil War veteran who also um, was the newspaper um, reporter editor. Um, I'd love to learn more about him, uh, that of just about his life, because it sounded like that he did quite a bit in between the Civil War and then um, until his death. But it's another one of those ones you just hope, wish you have the time to do the more research. I do know he does have a distant relative who lives in the Minnesota area who has been in contact with me before, who is still doing research on him. So 
he is not lost. You know, there are some there are people that still care about him. Um, there have been times where they've done some cleanups out there. There was uh, one uh, time in 1987 where uh, Kimberly McKnight, who was a Girl Scout at the time, um, did a cleanup project and uh, did some infills for where a lot of the graves had um, sunken down because the pine boxes had broken in. And then also Luther Services has done some work out there too. They, they did uh, some cleanup work in 2007. Um, but I've been working with uh, a volunteer for the Kentwood uh, Historical Commission. Her name is Jerry Norman. And we've been doing a lot to try and make a master map of all of this because there really isn't one. Um, and we've been using different things like uh, register books and death certificates and other things like that. Um, I found that there have been some surveys, one done in, uh, by the DAR in 1931 and another one from 1949 um, by Williamson Works. And we have made a map. It's not complete. Um, the Williamson Works survey is the one that's on the left there, but then the one that's on the right is what Jerry has put together using the research that her and I have done. And there's roughly about 800 people buried out there. That's our estimation. So... That's kind of the history of the Kent County Poorhouse. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. In the beginning, yeah, yeah. She had, I, I think it was about like seven or eight kids. Um, one thing I will say with her is that when she did go up to Traverse City, one of her sons, Elmer Ellsworth Oster, who is my great grandfather's, one of his older brothers, lived in Traverse City with his wife. So I think with her, it was more of a case of either dementia or something else that maybe the family couldn't take care of her and that she had reached the point where it's like, we got to put her someplace. And it and from what I've learned about the Traverse City Asylum, it probably was one of the better places at that time to go to. If you ever get a chance to do the tour up there, it's worth it. I did it just a couple months ago and you can learn quite a bit about what Munson was trying to do that whole thing about, you know, trying to, uh, you know, have these beautification places so that people could work their way through their mental health issues and with the hope of eventually getting back out into society. She didn't, but you know, at least she was at some place could have been worse. Yeah. In the back. Yes. So what eventually happened was that when Dalton kind of lost, lost the farm and everybody was on and he ran off, Luther Services then bought the building that he constructed in the mid 70s. And it's now still owned by them. Um, and it's now called Samaritas. They've kind of renamed it from Luther Home to Samaritas. So if anybody was at Luther Home, that was once the building was, you know, once everything was demolished and they built something new. Mm -hmm. Some of them, it was the case where they didn't have family or they just, there was a, a, another one example, um, I can't remember, uh, Klaus Schoenbeck was a guy who uh, was from a Dutch family that immigrated over in the 1870s. His father died, his mother remarried somebody who she shouldn't have married to, and um, a very abusive person, and he had a few other brothers and sisters, but he had a handicap that just, he couldn't be at home. And so from the eight. I think it was from like the 1880s up until his death, I think in between 1900 and maybe 1910, he's buried up at uh, um, um, the cemetery that's on the north side of Grand Rapids by the Creston neighborhood. Um, Fair Plains. Yes, thank you. He's buried up at Fair Plains with his sister. So, I mean, you would have people that were like that, that just could not be um, taken care of within their own family. And that was where they, uh, had people go to. But yes, there were others who like, they're on their own. Maybe they came over just off the boat and had an accident that nobody could take care of them or they couldn't take care of themselves. So, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. The 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 one on Riverside Drive. Yes. Yeah, that would be the Ionia County Infirmary. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there there were times. I uh, one of them who I'll never forget is Mercy Covell, who um, came from New York in the 1870s with her family. They were living up by uh, Elgoma Township. They dropped her off there in the 1870s. She was mentioned in the articles during both that 1874 investigation and in 1905. She was known for counting coins, so she must have had. Uh, some form of autism, something like that. But by the 1930s, she had been sent down to Kalamazoo and her body was donated to science after she died, uh, I think, in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there. Yep, there there was a building in downtown Grand Rapids that was run by the Little Sisters of the Poor. Yes, yeah. Um, but back to your question about my great great grandmother, she died in 1927, I believe. So she was at Traverse City for about three years. Yep. If they ran into each other, I hope they had pleasant exchanges. <laughs> or at least they were able to have some semblance of community. I, I know there was one time that uh, actually it was through the pictures that, uh, from Richmond Houghton that showed there was this young girl who had just terrible chronic ar arthritis that she was confined to a, a wheelchair. And this would have been in the, the early 50s. And one of her best friends was an elderly woman who had to have been in her 60s or late 60s or early 70s. And the two were just two peas in the pod. And like sometimes you can find this sense of community amongst the chaos that you're 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 now in. And I hope that the two of them were able to sort of bring some camaraderie ship and family to their circumstances because so much was outside of their control. Um, other questions? There, there is some things like that. Um, I, there, it's not something that I've really gotten well into though. I will say there is a project that is being done by a, Hope College professor with a few of his students where they were taking the records of the Ottawa County poorhouse and going through them, transcribing them, and they were trying to codify all of those different issues and reasons for why they went to that particular poorhouse. So they have started putting that stuff online and you could look at them and then see a bit more of a description of what they have on there. I just... I haven't really done that much into it, but that's a totally other like separate part of this whole piece that's worth getting into because knowing the definitions of the handicaps of, of different things is just as much worthwhile as knowing about the, the you know, the stories of the people themselves. Yeah. That's, uh, that's now Eastmanville park where you can go, um, um, the cemetery is back out there and the barns are still there. So yeah, when you're on your way to, I think it's like what spring Lake and grand Haven. Yeah. The one out on Leonard out there. So, so yes. Some of those are at the, um, state archives. I know there, there are some things that have been compiled together by the, um, Ionia, County Genealogical Society. If you ever get a ch uh, chance to talk with a gentleman by the name of John Pierce, who I think is their vice president, I've known him for several years, and he's done a pretty good job of trying to compile a lot of that stuff together. But it can be very haphazard with these. Some of these things are maybe in the hands of the county or at the state archives. They could be in the hands of people who were connected with the staff or there's some things that are at the Grand Rapids Public Library that were found out in a barn before they were starting to tear everything down 
county retention rules are usually like seven years, and at least for Kent County. And then after that, if they're not legally required to keep it, it's gone. And you also get into the issue of how much does HIPAA apply? Because if you're looking at the state asylums, you can't look at those red, those records because they're considered health records. But at what point does a poor farm transition into being a medical facility that would require it to be under HIPAA? That's a, that's a question I need a medical lawyer to, to kind of answer for me. Um, another whole component of it. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I know. Uh, and, and that's another just very sad, crazy part of our history. And I think one of the ways in which you kind of learn about that is when you're looking at like the probate records, because if anybody who is going to be institutionalized, they have to go through the probate court and looking at the rules in which they follow as they are determining if somebody is going to be institutionalized or not. And at what level are they going to be in, in, uh, institutionalized? And that's also another thing that I haven't been able to really like take some of these people like Esther Lott or um, some of the others that were sent to Kent County's facility and go through the probate records. Now, some of those have made the probate records for other counties have made it to the state archives and they're slowly digitizing them. But Kent County's, I know they're still over at the courthouse. And the only way that you can look at them is you got to give them a name and then they see if they have it on their their list of records and then they'll pull it out um that's another i don't know as somebody who works for government i i i understand both sides of it and and it and it's a really weird type of thing to deal with because you're dealing with people that are like they're 100 years old or like pre-hipaa i could have looked at the record but now that hipaa went into effect in what the 1990s something like that and even though it has these important protections, us as researchers are like, I want to look at my great great grandmother's reason for why she went to Traverse City, you know, something like that. It's, you know, I, w I wish I knew more about it, but that's still like another element of all this. I work a 40 hour a week job and I wish I had the time that I can make myself into three people one who researches poor houses, one who's doing the writing, and one who's making the paycheck at work. <laughs> so, other questions? Um, one thing I will just end on is that I do have some pictures of some other poor houses from around Michigan. Um, so we have uh, some of these ones like this is Tuscola County in Cairo, Crawford County, uh, Kalamazoo, uh, Midland, the Ionia County that some people have mentioned. Um, and that would be the one that was at the Riverside Drive and then the Jackson County one. Um, the one in Midland, you won't find that's gone because that's now a retention pond for uh, Dow Chemical. Kalamazoo counties, that's gone other than a barn being out there. Um, the Jackson County one burned um, several decades ago. And I think I have some pictures of, these are some ones that still exist. So Cass County um, is in Cassopolis. Um, Clinton County, uh, there's near just south of St. John's. You can see the Gratiot County one is still there too. Um, the Isabella County one, that's an interesting brief quick story I'm going to say is my dad and I were driving by there after going to a football game. Um, I think Grand Valley was playing and uh, I said, Hey, can we stop at, at this poorhouse location? And we got there, the building was for sale and the door was open. Oh yeah. We walked in <laughs> and we're walking around. And then like two minutes later, my dad being Mr. Safety, you know, the Eagle Scout, um, or as he says, Eagle Scout Bronze Palm, I got more back. <laughs> and he's like, I don't think we should be here. <laughs> but I did get enough. I've got about 30 photos from on the inside of it. Um, and so I, I, I have that. And then on the bottom here, we've got both the Montcalm County one on the bottom right that's uh, in Greenville. Um, it's being used as an adult foster care home. And what's interesting, the, the bottom middle one for Monroe County that's in Monroe, it's still called... Fairview County home. And I think it's one of the few that are still left that are one in their, uh, their building is from the 1920s and it's still being called the County home. Nobody else that I know of in Michigan still does that. 
So, um, and these are just a few other ones um, that uh, the Alger County one that's uh, being used as apartments and it doesn't look like it's changed that much. Alpinas is being used as an annex building for the medical center nearby. Schoolcraft, it was, uh, it's privately owned. It was once a uh, Ben breakfast at some point. And I recently found a teacup that actually has the picture of it on it. And I don't know why, but I found it on eBay. I bid for it. <laughs> And I'll warn everybody, if you see County Poor Farm postcards on eBay, I'm bidding on them. So don't get in my way. <laughs> but if there are any other questions, comments? Well, if anybody does want to ask, ask me anything afterwards, um, please feel free to come up to me. And thank you, everybody. It was really great getting to talk and share this interesting piece of our history. Thank you all for coming, um, and Adam, thank you for sticking around for questions. If anyone wants to ask questions and uh, consider getting a cookie bag on your way out. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay. Okay. Nearby. Okay. So were they in the what is it like Middlebrook neighborhood that's there? Okay. When I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. There was still a barn and an old farmhouse. Well. Yeah. Well, let me bring up. I know I've got the aerial image that's from the. I think it was the fifties. So. Oh yeah, I've I've heard story.